In the previous videos, I reviewed the principles or the conventions of the Just War theory, exploring why there is such a thing as the Just War tradition, and some of the motivations and then the theoretical approaches behind the principles that we've inherited today. In the last video, I outlined the key principles of the Just War theory as it's usually taught in schools and military colleges and universities, outlining the principles of the Jus ad Bellum, the Latin for the justice of war, the principles of Jus in Bello, or the Latin for the justice of acts within war, and the principles of the Jus post Bellum, the Latin for the justice of the peace after the war. In the following videos, we're going to look at the key principles of the conventions in more detail, so you can get a glimpse into the potential controversies that can arise and hopefully stir your own critical thinking. Now, in this video, we'll be reviewing the first principle of the Jus ad Bellum, the principle that there must be a just cause to go to war in the first place. After all, possessing a justifiable cause is the first and perhaps the most important condition of the just war tradition. We shall review the belief that no justification is actually needed, and secondly, the claim that it is might or strength that determines the justification of going to war. Arguably, both of these assertions are weak, but they need to be addressed because they, and especially the might is right argument, are popularly held. So, by what notion of right or justice may a people declare war against another? Surely anyone who wants to wage war against another country or people could declare any reason they like. Why should there be a justification? Well, let's consider this logic of asserting that there need not be any justification at all for waging war before reviewing why things such as excuses, reasons and justifications have a tendency to creep into human discourse, especially when we're dealing with such a tumultuous phenomenon as war. Simply put, where there's a war, we want to find someone at fault. We want to lay the blame somewhere, and in doing so, we may begin to outline what justifications there are for waging war. Indeed, we find that over time, theorists have helped to raise our understanding by limiting the justifiable reasons for war from any reasons good enough to more particular justifications based on the failure of alternatives to maintaining peace, for example. That's a complex idea, so we will be breaking it down. But we're going to start with the logic of there's no need for justifying war. The anything-goes ploy reeks of what we can call whimsicality or nihilism. It suggests that if a group feels like fighting, then it has a justification. The group, or its leaders, do not have to provide any more reasons. But as thoughtful folk... We cannot glibly accept that people will do things without some form of reasoning. Indeed, I just felt like it is a reason in itself when we think about it, for it implies that one feeling was considered more useful to act on than another, which then refers us to the moral or functional nature of the feeling that justified the act. And so we can ask, are there some feelings that are evil in themselves, or as the Latin has it, mala in se. That would imply that they cannot be justifiable excuses. And behind that question, we can then ask about the nature of evil. But let's take this argument of whimsicality, that there need not be a justification, on a, on a kind of face value. A leader or a group decides on a whim to wage war against another people. And let's assume, rather idealistically, that no wars have ever been waged between them in the past, and that this is the first time an act of aggression will have been committed against the neighbours. It must have happened somewhere in deep history. But there's a problem. If that were ever the case, historically, either the history of tribes, nations, empires, or even gangs, it would not likely last long. For a war to exist, there must be a group. Wars involve groups. So we're not talking about a single psychopath going on a rampage. And groups have to work together, cooperate at some level. A group also implies that there is a bunch of individuals who typically may have differing views on the reasons for waging war and for avoiding war. 
there may indeed be a unanimous decision to whimsically wage war. However, there will inevitably, sooner or later, be some form of dissent. Now, a simple reason for a potential of dissent is that any forms of violence are literally costly to life and property, and therefore, at the least, violence will be costly to some of the interests of each member of the group, even if some dissenters mutter that a better way could be waged later or against a different people. And therein lies the potential for dissent. Pain, suffering, fear, the expectation of injury and death, or the ability to persevere, the expectation of war gains, they're all subjective valuations of action. And in being so, are going to be inherently different across a group of people, or even through the same individual, like a leader, over different times of the year or the day even. That logic undermines the potential for persistent unanimity. Some people will always have more to lose, or believe that they will have more to lose, than others in war. Never mind if they possess a higher sense of consciousness or being in the world regarding maintaining civilised values or not. So the countervailing party for peace is likely to gain more of a voice as the costs of unjustified or unexplained warfare rise. Sooner or later, as the pain of war increases, questions will be asked. And if they are thwarted or oppressed, the evil of unexplainable violence is likely to self-destruct in the killing of the leaders or the splitting of the group or its defeat from a neighbouring group who are tired of having to deal with out-of-control bandits. This reaction just becomes more complex with settled societies and their state apparatus. A coup d'etat, overthrow of the government, has replaced the plot and assassination or exile of whimsical leaders, but it's subject to the same logic. On the other hand, we must admit that a group on intent, intent on sending themselves to the Valhalla of the Nordic myths, where they believe slain warriors will play war games with the gods all day, they may never rise to such dissent or even to such concerns. Arguably, and something I'll be exploring in later tutorials, their very being in the world or their level of consciousness tolerates no conscience or even self-interested, life-affirming, temporary values. They are purely predatory, violent and destructive, taking pleasure from wanton killing. An animal predator attacks and kills because it is hungry. It needs to eat. We understand that the lion will take down a gazelle, or an eagle will pounce on a rabbit. They do so from their level of consciousness, which warrants no choice as such. But we do find it difficult to accept that some people act similarly. That is, without any concept of making a choice, and hence having any reasons or justifications for doing what they do. They just attack and kill usually wantonly and without remorse. Now, such a psychology may indeed have the seeds of its own destruction because people want to defend themselves from such murderous folk and will take precautions. But the implicit nihilism of wage in war for its own sake is something that civilization has always sought to deny or to restrain because it is so inhumane and is so similar to the mentality of a remorseless murderer, a sociopath or a psychopath. Groups, full of a variety of people, inevitably seek to rest restrain such dangerous individuals and their cliques. Once we get past the murderous nihilist waging war for its own sake, we can begin driving some thought, some reasons into what we're talking about, about war, its initiation, and hence its justification, beyond the whimsicality of a beast. Well, sometimes the beast thinks it is right because it is the beast, the most powerful animal, tribe, leader around, and it wants to throw its weight around and get everyone else to do its bidding and live according to its values. This is the argument made in variations on a theme by those who espouse the belief that might determines right. This is the theory that the greater power, or the slightest military, or the most unrelenting aggressor who becomes the winner, is basically justified because they have won. They have survived. The weak have perished. Now this resonates with some political neo-Darwinians and similar theorists who 
emphasize the nature of life as being the survival of the fittest, which they tend to imply the survival of the strongest or those that destroy or exploit the weak. So, the argument continues, their prowess and employment of force is the means by which a justification is produced. And this is what can be considered a logical fallacy, even though it permeates much of human history and narrative. The logic goes like this. The fact that we won a war means that we were in a special position to win the war. We may refer to our intelligence or the superiority in religion, winning God's favour in our cultural or racial superiority that enables victory. But of course, we can only describe such values and reasons for victory after the fact. But then that becomes a motivating belief. One victory may then spur a group, a polity, a nation, a government, whatever you will call it, onto the next war. And they may justify their aggression based on their record of victories. However, as we should all recall from financial investment advertisements or from basic logic, past performance is no indicator of future performance. The ancient Greeks were excellent moralists in exploring how often such pride or hubris, as they termed it, ended in disaster. In English, we still have the idiom, pride comes before a fall, yet that does not stop the proud or the boastful or the presumptuous from asserting their right to supremacy in various walks of life. Moreover, if we are defeated, then all those values and a host of other reasons humans have fun coming up with may help explain why we had to succumb to the greater force, our enemy. It would imply that we are now the lesser kind of folk, the people who are to be subjugated, enslaved, murdered, or ethnically cleansed from the region, and so on. Yet, history often provides plenty of evidence of the defeated and subjugated rising up in some form or other to reassert their existence and even toppling great nations and empires. So might, justifying the right, shifts from one party to another. Like the Wheel of Fortune, it's not a very reliable indicator of justice. The might is right argument can also be subtly employed in the arguments for military necessity or national interest, in which the immediate needs of the military, or the apparent needs of the ruling classes, the government or whomever, define the justification for waging war. It is an argument that was debated by Plato Socrates, noted over 2,000 years ago. Socrates sought, according to some not very successfully, an alternative view of justice that transcended immediate victories or the temporary ruler's interests or the mighty declaring what is right as it was in their favour. He sought a more universal understanding of justice and right that was independent of such ephemeral values that come and go. And the attempt, I would argue, is one that still permeates just war thinking and much of ethics today. Putting aside the might is right argument, since it is based on past performance and hence a logical fallacy, and having discarded the justification that wars may be waged on a whim, in the next tutorial we shall review some of the other justifications for initiating war. Thank you for listening. Comments appreciated and I'll get round to them when I can. Cheers.